Isaiah chapter 27. Uh, here's what it says, verse 3. It says, I, the Lord, to keep it, I will water it. Talking about a garden. I will water it every moment, lest any hurt it, and I will keep it night and day. Fury is not in me. Who would set the briars and thorns against me in battle? Now, when it says that, uh, who would set the briars and thorns against me in battle? You know when, uh, when a, a, a company or a platoon or whatever are, are going cross country, they set up a perimeter. And if they're going to be there any length of time, they put out concertina wire. And that concertina wire is just not something you want to mess with. You, I mean, it is just wait. It is just wait to cut you up. Well, in Bible days, they didn't have barbed wire. They didn't have concertina wire, anything like that. Uh, and so here's what they did. They built what was called a trench. It was basically a dry moat. Uh, it might be as deep as this room. It might be about as wide as uh, that wall is. Tall. So you know, it's 10 feet high or 8 feet high and 8 feet wide and 8 feet up. Uh, and that was, it was basically it was a dry moat. Uh, it was a trench because anybody uh, going to charge at night, they're not, they're not getting across that. That's got to stop. Also, they go out and get the briars and the thorns and they weave them together uh, and set them around the perimeter because that would slow you down. Okay? So here's God. He said... He said, I want to come after you. Now, who's going, to, who's going to set the briars and thorns against me? Can you see God saying, I'm going to come after you? And he's coming after you, and here's some thorns and briars and God. Oh, well, yeah, guess I got to turn around. <laughs> now, I, was reading this, uh, I was reading this story about these two lions, uh, the lions of uh, man-eaters of Savo in Africa. The Brits were putting in a... Uh, they're putting in a rail line. Had all these natives working, uh, and these two—I uh, think it was called the uh, Power and the Darkness. These two, two uh, lines. In fact, they made a movie about that. How many have you seen that movie? What are you guys doing on the movie? <laughs> <laughs> Love to do that. Anyway, um, uh, and I was reading this book uh, about it. I've read the book, but anyway, I was reading this book about it, uh, and it said that they have these—they have these workers, these native workers in a camp, and they—they they literally had uh, big old. Uh, briars and thorns all the way around that camp because they didn't have barbed wire. And he said, one of these lions low crawled, low crawled through those briars, went up to one of the tents where one of those natives was sleeping, grabbed him by the waist with his jaws, and then used him as a ram to go out. Now that will leave an impression on him. <laughs> that can ruin your whole day. What he did have with him after that ruined his whole, his whole life. But he said, who'd set the briars and thorns against me in battle? I would go through them. I would burn them together. Or let them take hold of my strength that they may make peace with me. And he shall make peace with me. Let's bow our heads. Let's talk to the Lord. Father, it is good to be saved. God, we thank you, Lord, for this nice day outside. It's been cold. It's been pretty nasty. And I guess it's going to get nasty again. But Lord, we thank you for the sun. We thank you for a little bit of warmth. We thank you for that. God, we thank you again that we can be in this church because we want to be. We can hear your Bible because we want to hear it. We can get together and have fellowship. We have plenty of food. You have still blessed this country. We're still enjoying your blessing. And Lord God, I fear for the day that you would ever withhold your blessing. Now, I don't even mean curse our country. Just withhold your blessing. And our lives will change radically. So, Lord, here we are, and I ask you now, Father, please <clears throat> speak to the hearts of these individuals, God. They're here because of you, and I pray, God, they get something from you. Amen. And I pray somebody here, Lord, get something that will help them down the road for thee. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, the situation here is a man at war with God. Well, I'll tell you, buddy, you want to pick a fight with somebody, God is not the one you want to pick a fight with. You don't want to pick a fight with somebody and just think, and it's over. That is just how it is. Uh, and so... Uh, here's the picture. The picture is that God, that, that this man, uh, this individual, is, is at war with the God of heaven. You say, who in the world would be dumb enough to be that way? You? I'm sorry, but, but even in our churches, we have people like that. Uh, something got you mad at God. Something got you cross at Him. Uh, and, and you know what you need? You need what it says here. You need to make peace with God. Now, when two nations go to war, or when two individuals go to war, let me tell you why we will never have peace in Iraq. The object of a fight is to break the will of your adversary. Remember the old days, you say uncle and I'll let you up. Yeah. Say an uncle was, was, they were breaking their will to resist you. You don't have to kill your enemy. You've got to break their will. Could you explain to me how this nation here went to war with two of the greatest military powers in the world at the same time? 
hey guys, those Germans and those Japanese were not a bunch of camel jockeys who could only shoot holes in clouds with their rifles. So when you go uh, to war with somebody, you have, I'll tell you, you win it. You kill them. That's right. Or, or how do you say, say stop the war? You kill them. Or they kill you. Or you surrender to them. Or they surrender to you. Now that's it. The Japanese, we beat them up until they surrendered. You know how they surrendered? It was unconditioned. They surrendered. Those Germans surrendered. It was unconditioned. And so, if you're at war with God today, let me explain something. You're not going to kill him. I mean, that's an option. But that's been tried. I mean, Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, somebody got more power than you and smarter than you thought that he would throw God off his throne and sit on his throne in his place and say, I shall be like the Most High. Lucifer thought that he would kill God and replace him, and, and Lucifer couldn't do it. I got news for you. You'll never do it. Amen. So you're not going to kill God. Do you want God to kill you? Then the other option is God has to surrender. Can I ask you a question? You think you're going to make God surrender. <laughs> I mean, you're going to make God surrender. You're going to make somebody surrender that doesn't even know what time is. You just go, I'll, I'll just wait. You'll wait. You will wait. To, you'll wait to somebody that a day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day. I mean, come on, guys. You know what you might say? You say, well, I'll, 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 I'll hold off for 25 years. God says, I'll, okay, I'll just hold off for one day. <laughs> and after about 25 years, God's going to say, I surrender. So the options, the options are for us to kill God, or Him to kill us, or for Him to surrender to us, for us to surrender to Him, and that's what we're talking about today. Now let me tell you why you might have a problem with God. You say, oh, preacher, preacher, we love the Bible, man, we're straight on the book, we love the Lord. <coughs> but in a, even in a crowd of here, there is somebody whose jaws are a little bit tight toward God. There is somebody, something in your life has not set well with you, something has upset you with God, and and you are not at peace with God. Now, some of it is not your fault. Uh, I don't think that sin can ever be said it's not your fault because if it's not your fault, it's not sin. But not all of, uh, all of the problems you have are your fault. And, and have you ever heard this term? And it's a valid term. A victim of circumstance. You say, what is that? Well, that's when you buy the house and then find out that it's riddled with termites. Really, I mean, that is not your fault. Some people are a victim of circumstance. Uh, sometimes it is problems with your family. I don't want to know your woeful family problems. I don't want to know about your dad. I don't know about. I don't want to know about who didn't love you, who didn't treat you right. My dad didn't love me, guys. Uh, I was born two years after my parents' last child. I have a sister six years older than me. I had a brother two years older than me. And when my parents, when they had my brother, they said, "That's all." Um, they got rid of all the baby clothes. Ladies, they got rid of the diapers that you washed. Okay? I mean, you wash these diapers and you got to dig paper and plastic out of your filter on your dryer. But, um, uh, you know, they got rid of all the play pens and the baby, all the baby furniture, all the toys, uh, all the diapers. They got rid of all that stuff. Uh, and two years later, I came along. I was what was known in 1950 as a surprise. <laughs> Today, that would be, I would be an abortion. Now you gotta admit, guys, don't you think surprise is a better word? Yeah. Yeah. You've never stepped into a dark house and a bunch of people all of a sudden the lights came on, balloons were there, party hats, and everybody had jumped out and went, Abortion! <laughs> <laughs> I mean surprise is a much much better word. Uh, but because I was, uh, they didn't want more children, I was I was not loved. My parents really it was not an abusive uh, situation. I was just kind of a non person. And, and I tell people, so my father didn't love me. You know why? Because my father had good taste, that's why. When I think about me, I don't even like me that much. <laughs> but maybe, guys, maybe there's just something in your family that just was not right. And maybe, you know, maybe there's something in your life, something in your past, something in your family, uh, and it is not your fault. Can I tell you something? I'm sorry. I'm sorry if your family life was, uh, was not a good one. I'm sorry if there's some bad thing back here that you need to put behind you. But, but I'm telling you, it's not your fault, all right? But you know what you're saying? I didn't have this coming. I didn't do this to myself. I didn't have this coming. And you tend to blame God because you know what you know? You know God could have stopped it, don't you? You know God could have got it, rescued you somehow or stopped the person that was doing it, whatever the case may be. God could have rescued you and just a little bit, there's just a little bit of anger toward God because God did not come to your to your aid. Uh, when I say uh, victim of circumstances, maybe it's a marriage. 
Uh, you know, uh, we were talking, we were talking at the end of the service <clears throat> about my book called Living with Pain. <coughs> and, uh, uh, and, and whenever I'm talking about it, I always have to explain it. You know, I hold up this book called Living with Pain. And then I'll, I always get to jump. Did your wife write that? <laughs> <laughs> and I tell them, no, obviously she didn't. It's only this big. I said, it's entirely too thin. I said, my wife is, is working on a two volume set called Living with the Pain. <laughs> But I don't think anybody ever said, let's get married so we can be miserable. Let's get married so I can go out on you or you'll go out on me. Let's get married so you can beat me regularly. Okay? I don't think I've ever met a young lady who says, man, I hope I'll marry a soak. I hope I'll marry a guy that, you know, like she, he beats me on a regular basis and goes out. I don't think I've ever met a young lady who won that. And that does happen, but that's not what she thought marriage was going to be. I don't think I've ever met a guy who said, man, I hope I'll marry somebody that everything she makes is a burnt offering. <laughs> Their one claim to fame, she won the bonbon eating contest, has remained in, in uh, practice or, uh, uh, or training ever since. <clears throat> Nobody has ever wanted to say, let's get married so we can have a bad marriage. But having a bunch of them turned into that. Right. And you know, I, I know we say, well, it takes two. It doesn't always take two faith. They, yeah, there can be some problems between both of them, but I'm telling you, uh, it could be that one person is just doing as right as they can, and the other person, it just decides that all of a sudden, uh, uh, they just want to go off into the world and, and live another life and be another person. And you say, yeah, you know what? Our marriage was fine, uh, and then this came along, and I didn't have it coming. I agree with you. I'm not telling you it's your fault. I'm telling you today you're a victim of circumstances. You, but here's the problem. You know God could stop them. You say God could have kept them in, you know, from wandering and God could have taken care of our marriage. God could have taken care of our problems. And just a little bit inside, it makes you a little bit mad. Hey, maybe it's victim of circumstance. Maybe it's family. Maybe it's marriage. Maybe it's just you. Now, you guys know who Don Knotts was. Don Knotts. Here, wait a second. There. Don Knotts. <laughs> You know, nobody ever asked Don Knotts to be a superhero in a movie. I mean, they might ask him to be a bowling pin, but nobody ever asked this guy to be a... I mean, you know, Don Knotts always, to me, was the, the human equivalent to a chihuahua. Who wants a dog that barks and then shakes for 30 seconds because it scared itself? But Don Knotts was a funny man. He was really a funny man. But I'm telling you guys, nobody ever asked him to, you know, be the macho guy in the box or anything else. Uh, and, and one time he was doing an interview, and somebody said this. They said, you're very funny. And they said, what makes you so funny? And his, his response was this. Uh, he, said, he said, well, it helps when you look like this. <laughs> oh, wait a second. You think that ever bothered him? Uh, you think that ever bothered him? That, uh, you know, when they talked about guys like John Wayne and Cary Grant and, uh, and, and, and uh, Kirk Douglas. Those guys were contemporary with Don Knotts. And they talked about Don Knotts and um, who's those other great manly people? <laughs> Howdy Doody. <laughs> guys, guys, maybe, maybe it's a personal problem with you. Uh, let me tell you about a young child. This Christian couple, a good Christian couple, they had their first child, little boy. And he was just a little baby and a cute little baby. And when that baby was about six months old, he developed a thing about that big, about the size of an almond on, on the outside of his left ankle. And they went to the doctor. The doctor said, well, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a gland or something like that. Uh, and, uh, and they kind of let it pass. Uh, and that thing got a little bit bigger to the size of a walnut. Then it got bigger to the size of, his, of an egg. And they took that little baby in, and they found out that little boy had von Recklinghausen's disease. Von Recklinghausen's disease to you is called elephantitis. And that left leg began to grow faster than that boy's body. And before long, uh, th that, his ankle was about that big around. By the time he was about 12, he had that much of a lift on his right shoe because his left leg was that much longer. Eventually, his left leg was six inches longer than his right. His ankle began to fold out over top of his shoe. And, and what von Recklinghausen's disease is, basically, it's, it is unrestricted growth, but it's not cancer. And it can come up, uh, it can be uh, uh, tumors, benign tumors that can grow anywhere in the body. Literally in the optic nerve. Any place on the skin. Any place in the body, in the fiber of the muscle. 
That young guy, uh, I think by the time he's 18 years old, they took his leg off below the knee. That young man, right now, uh, he, he got him, he got married, uh, and um, and this lady, uh, they got married, and, and she looked at him one day and she said, "I just can't take this anymore. He's got bumps and tumors and things all over him." And she left him. He didn't bring this on himself. And right now, they're about to take his leg off above the knee. You know what? It'd be easy for a guy like that to say, I don't live for God. God could have stopped this. I'm telling you, that young man has been reading his Bible and in church. Uh, I, I've known that young guy, and I, I've seen him when he's just about to throw his hands up and walk out, but he never threw his hands up and walked out. He never threw his Bible across the room and said, I quit. He is not mad at God. Do you understand? But don't you think if he wanted somebody to shake a fist at God and blame him for the physical problems he's got, I don't know what your complaint is, but I don't think anybody here has got the complaint that that young man's got. And that young man's in church today. And what I'm telling you guys is maybe, maybe that you, you need to make peace, peace with God because of circumstances of your life that are not your fault. Sometimes, uh, you know, there's two kinds of diabetes. There's the kind you get when you get older. Uh, and uh, a lot of times it's because you're overweight or you didn't eat right. But then you get the, the brittle diabetes, these little children. My goodness, man, they get that. I mean, they just spike their numbers. There's nothing they can ever do. Life is never normal for them. Don't you think it'd be easy for somebody like, somebody like that to get bitter against God and say, this hasn't been fair? Can I tell you something? It hasn't been fair. <laughs> and so maybe that's what you need to be concerned about. <laughs> maybe it's not circumstances of life. Maybe it's what I call misconceptions of God. Now, who would think at a Bible believing church somebody have a misconception of God? Me. <laughs> oh man, listen, I know you. You know what you are? You are human. Right. And you have you are afflicted with what I call terminal humanity. You are human and it's going to kill you. Mm -hmm. And though we have knowledge of the Bible and knowledge of Scripture and we, we know where the book is, we still have those frailties of humanity. Say, what kind of misconception of God? Some people think God owes himself. God owes me success. You have no idea over the 40 years I've been saved how many businesses uh, I've had guys say, well, you come, we're starting a business, and, uh, and, and will you dedicate this business to God. Now, what that means is God's going to make me rich. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, they all think, you know, if I dedicate this business to God, it's going to fly, and, and I'm going to just make uh, money hand over fist, and I just, I guess I just have to force myself to take it on. <laughs> and we think God owes us something. Let me tell you what God owes you. He owes you hell. Yeah. And if you're not going to hell, you're getting off light. Amen. Uh, I was talking to a guy, and he was telling me, he, he mentioned, he said, I was at a preacher's meeting, and this guy didn't like you. And, and he said, you want to know who it is? I said, no. No, I said, because I might meet him someday, and then that would alter the way I would treat him. Uh, and I said, he said, he said, he said some bad things about you. I said, let me ask, he said, you want to know what he said? I said, just let me answer this. Did he say I deserve hell? He said, no. I said, then I got off light. I don't care what the guy said. Amen. Nothing compares to the fact that I am telling Amen. you right now. I am not telling you people that I used to deserve hell. I am telling you that stand behind this pulpit at this moment, I deserve hell. I am telling you that God split the floor of this thing and split your basement open and split the earth open beneath my feet and dropped me live into hell itself. I would only get what I deserve. Now, that won't happen because I've trusted Christ. <laughs> but that doesn't mean because I'm not going to hell that I don't deserve hell. And we get this idea, God owes me something. Hey, don't you know I got the King James Bible? You know, my oldest son, Jonathan, uh, he was in the Marine Corps. <clears throat> and uh, and, he, and he, when, he, when he got through boot camp, you know, we were talking. And, and I was talking to him about, uh, about qualifying down the marksmanship range. I want to know because I was pretty hard on that one. I want to know how well he did. But anyway, he said, oh, Dad, he said, I did good. He shot second best on Paris Island. He, he did a real good job. I said, John, did you have any problems? He said, no, I didn't, Dad. But he said, man, this poor boot next to me, he did. I said, what happened? He said, well, first off, he said the day we were down there to qualify, it was raining. Now, guys, you know, it rains here. Uh, up, in, up in Seattle, it doesn't rain. It just drizzled, drizzles 24 hours a day for about 12 months. <laughs> but down in Carolina, brother, you can fill that cup with about three drops. I mean, those things that hit you knock you unconscious. <laughs> so they're out on the field, and this rain is just coming down on top of them. And he said, I, I said, what happened, John? He said, uh, he said, this kid, he said he couldn't get anything down, down range. He couldn't get it on, on target or nothing. 
And he, I said, well, what happened? He said, well, he said, one of the DIs saw him. And one DI came over for some close personal fellowship. <laughs> I mean, this kid is trying to get something on target, and this DI is talking to him about his his intellect level, uh, his family background, and sundry other things. And I said, well, what did he do, John? He said, Dad, he almost made a fatal mistake. He said, what was that? He said, he tried to get sympathy out of that DI. Now, guys, guys, you're in a ring court. If you were a DI, this is not a derogatory remark. Don't get mad at me. If you want sympathy, go to a rattlesnake with a backache. <laughs> but don't go to ring DI. He's not there to hold your hand. <clears throat> and I said, John, I said, what did he do? And he said, he looked up at that guy and he said, sir, but it's raining, sir. I said, oh, John, what happened? He said, Dad, he said, that, that boot, that, that guy leaned over and he put that smoking bear hat. He said, he put the brim of that right on the bridge of that boot's nose. And he said, it poured down rain. He says this, he said, he said, boot, it don't rain on the reeds. It rains around the reeds. <laughs> Yes, sir. You know what you all believe? You all believe that if this America, if this country does not get right with God, God's going to judge it, don't you? You know what most of you believe? And when he does, because you've got a King James Bible, the judgment of God will fall, won't fall on you and fall around you. Well, I'm going to tell you something, guys. You get that thing where you think God owes you something, and when he doesn't come through where you think you owe him, you know what will happen? You'll need to make peace with God. And so maybe it's a misconception of God. Maybe you thought that he owed, he owed you something. Maybe you just thought he'd make it okay. You know, there are just some people thinking that God will just, God will just make it okay. Uh, in Australia, they say this, she'll be right. Now that is, the short, that is the short form of she'll be right in the day. Which means if you say, hey, uh, what are we going to do about that? And they'll say, she'll be right, mate. That means when the time comes, everything will work out. She'll be right in the day. When that day comes, everything will be all right. Uh, and we got this idea. You know, I know I know young couples who have gone to the altar and gotten married when they question whether they should get married. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the prayer you don't want to come to the altar with. Uh, Lord, if you don't want to get married, just stop it. He won't stop it. We say, well, I ask him to. That's right, but he won't stop it. You know what he'll do? He'll tell you to stop. Oh, yeah, but I can't do that. Uh, I'll embarrass him. Then, then go on and get married to the wrong person. Well, we'll just get married. Uh, it, it'll work out. It won't work out. Now, maybe it can, but I'll tell you. I, I know a lot of people, they just think that everything's going to work out. God is going to make all of this right. You just go bounding through the, the, the brush and stumbling over in your own stupidity and make every blunder on earth, and God will just make it all right. And then you know what happens? God doesn't make it all right. God doesn't come through. Listen, God is not supposed to come behind you like you're some draft horse and he's got a, a broom uh, and a dustpan and sweep up every mess that you made and make it all right. And maybe I'm talking to somebody, you had some things, maybe it's your stupidity, maybe it's your na naivety, whatever the case was, that you marched off, you know, a, a boldly into the fog and it didn't work out. And you say, well, I think God could have made it okay. I, yeah, I think God could have made it okay. I just don't think he has to. Maybe it's because misconception of God, you thought God was going to make you rich and famous. You know, if the lotteries have hurt our country in any way, you know how they've hurt it? Everybody in this country is looking for windfall wealth. You know, my dad's generation was this. Um, my dad would say this to an 18-year-old kid. You work for 30 years, kid. Get a job and work for 30 years. When you're tired, you'll have something. My generation would say this to an 18-year-old. Get a job and work for 30 years. When you're done, you'll have something. But let's not wait 30 years to take a week off. Let's go have a little good time every now and then. Go fishing once or twice a week. Here's what I want you to do. Go walk up some 18-year-old outside of high school and say, Hey, kid, get a job and work for 18 years, and, and for 30 years, and at the end of it, you'll have something. You'll take, he'll, he'll look at you like you just stepped off flying saucer. <laughs> he'll say, Are you kidding? 30 years? You want me to wait? Don't you know I'm going to be an American Idol? Don't you know I'm going to be on Survivor? Don't you know that I'm working on a computer game and when they buy it, I'm going to be a multimillionaire? And we now have raised a generation and the entire generation is looking for, for windfall wealth. These lotteries, they all made people think that next week I'm going to be rich. I'm going to tell you something, bucko. Anybody who thinks they're going to be rich next week is not going to work this week. They are not going to work this week if next week they're going to hit it. And they don't hit it next week. 
but next week they will. And they don't hit it that week, but next week they will. And they spend their entire life looking for the windfall wealth. Now they're playing the lottery. They're, they're trying to get on some TV program. Now I know you guys aren't going to play the lottery. You're hoping somebody rear ends you. <laughs> I mean, you're going to fall out on the highway grabbing your neck saying, man, how bad are you hurt? I'd say $5 million worth. <laughs> That's right. We're all looking for windfall wealth. We're all looking to be rich and famous. Why would you want to be famous? Take a look at whatever. They got a camera someplace. Uh, and, and, and look at the fools in back of that camera mugging for it. You know, you'll see some guy. There's a big old bill on fire. And he's, he's for the news guy. And he's reporting. And, and somebody go, step out behind him going. And then you'll see this. You'll go. And he is calling his friend. I'm on TV. I'm on TV. What is wrong with you, man? I mean, you talk about the shallow end of the gene pool, bud. What is wrong with you? And we all think God, God's going to make us rich and famous. Nate doesn't make us rich and famous. I was youth director for a number of years. I had a young man in my youth department. He was a good basketball player. He really was. He couldn't jump, but he was a good basketball. Player. And I'll never forget one day, he said, I need to talk to you in your office. So we sat down in the office. And he sat there uh, across the desk from me. And he said this, oh man, listen. He said, it was so solid. It was so holy, such a precious moment. He said, just like this. He said, my brother again. He said, I just want to let you know, I just gave my basketball talent to God. <laughs> Stupid me. I didn't even know God was getting up a team. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, um, I said, you just gave your basketball talent to God, huh? He said, he said, yes. I said, so it's God's do it as he pleases, right? Yes. You know what he's saying, don't you? Okay. Force riches on me. Force fame. Go ahead and make me a pro. I'll try to deal with it. <laughs> right? I said, I said, you gave your basketball talent to God, right? Yes. I said, it's his do it as he pleases, right? Yes. I said, what if he tells you don't ever use it again? King? Yeah. Look, 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 look. What if I told Brother Bill this? Uh, Brother Bill, I'm going to give you that GMC. This is just an illustration. <laughs> I'm going to give you my GMC truck. So I give him that truck. Tomorrow morning, I sign the title over of that truck in his name. That's tomorrow, Monday. And Tuesday, I call him up and I say, Brother Bill, um, I had some furniture but Can I borrow your truck? And he'd say, no. I said, well, I'll give it to you. He'd say, I know. Well, you could lend it to me. He said, yeah, I sure could. Well, why don't you lend it to me? I don't lend my truck. I never lend my truck out there. But I gave it to you. That's right. But you gave it to me. And now it's mine. If you want to keep it, you could have kept it. Isn't that right? Now he wouldn't do that, right? <laughs> but look, this kid gave his talent to Jesus. You know why he gave his basketball talent to God? Not because he wanted God to be glorified, because he wanted God to make him rich and make him famous. And I wonder how many of you, I wonder how many of you are praying for a million dollars. I love that man. I'm praying for a million dollars. And here's how you, here's how you justify I'll tithe it. <laughs> now let me tell you something. I like Jim Brown. I've known Jim for 25 years. Jim, is it okay if I give you $1,000? Okay, I'm going to. I'm going to give Jim Bradley $1,000. As soon as you give me 10000 See, if you give me 10000 then I'm going to give you 1000 back. Now, don't you think Jim can figure this out? <laughs> I mean, can you guys stop and think about your, please give me a million dollars prayer? You're telling God, doesn't God already have the million? Because that's who you're asking for, or from. He's already got the million, and you're trying to, to what? Carry it on a stick? <laughs> You're going to fool God into giving you a million because you promised to give him a hundred thousand? He's got to lose nine hundred thousand to finally get a hundred thousand out of you? Are you out of your mind? Come on, man. This is God. I mean, you don't even have to be God to figure that one out. I'm a dirtball and I can see what's wrong with that. <laughs> Guys, you know what you thought? You thought God would make you rich and God would make you famous and God's going to give you a million dollars. You thought by now everything would be different and it hasn't. But you know what happens? In here, there's a little bit of anger. Just a little bit of bitterness. God could have blessed me more than this. He could have blessed my business. He could have blessed my endeavors. Hey guys, maybe your problem today is not a uh, victim of circumstances. Uh, and it's not a misconception of God. Maybe it's just old-fashioned sin. 
You know what the new the new thing in our churches is? Sin is not new in our churches. It's really not. There's always been sin. I don't even know that there's more sin. I don't know that there is. But you know what the what the new thing in our church is? It's kind of like this. A, a, a man would come up to the pastor, Brother Bill, and say this. Brother Bill, sure, I, sh I shot and killed that guy. But, but, but why do I have to give up a Sunday school class? Yeah. None of us can understand that there should be any responsibility for our actions. I'm talking about even the older folks. It is like I should be able to do anything I want. It's just not fair. You know what the mantra of the world is today? Don't judge me. Yeah. You know, this uh, uh, Britney Spears has a younger sister. When that girl was 16 years old, she had a child out of wedlock. We called that whoredom when I was a kid. When I was lost. Don't say to tell me. I'm a self-righteous Christian. That's what we call them when I was lost. So you got this 16-year-old girl who is immoral and, and ends up having a child out of wedlock. Don't say it's not her fault. She was there when it happened. She, it has to be part of her fault. And, and I'm watching CNN as they're reporting. I don't care about this girl. I don't care about her sister either, okay? But, but this, this announcer on CNN said something about this girl. You know, she's 16 years old. She's having a child out of wedlock. And he says, no, we're not judging her. I thought, why don't you? That's exactly what's wrong. A girl will do something like that, and CNN won't say there's anything wrong with that. You go out and tell somebody they're going to hell, you say that Muslims are not saved, and boy, they'll judge you in a heartbeat, won't they? Yeah. 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 And you know, the whole thing is, is, I don't want to be judged. You know what we want? We want to sin and continue the status quo. Right. And you know what the problem might be, guys? It just might be your sin. I don't blame somebody for your sin. It's not your dad's fault. It's not your mom's fault. It's not your preacher's fault. It's not your husband's fault. It's not your wife's fault. It's not your parents. It's not your children. Look, if you want to go sin and don't have anybody to blame, if you really want to and you're desperate, blame me. I mean, it won't be my fault. And I can shoulder it, buddy. I mean, you just blame me. Blame anybody you want. But I'm going to tell you whose fault it is. It is the person who looks back at you from the mirror every time you look in. And, and maybe it's just some sin in your life. And when the, when the judgment came on that sin, you thought it wasn't fair. You know why? Because you saw a world that gets away with murder. I heard about a, a guy in California beat his mother to death with a club and got 10 months probation. Say, they ought to kill him. Yeah, you told the judge, right? Yeah. Yeah, they ought to hang the judge and the guy that killed his mom. And, and you see people that, you know, how come on, how many times you allowed something in your life, and you know why you allowed it? Because you, you knew somebody that allowed it in their life, and they got away with it, or they got off light. Can I tell you something? Don't you say God's judgment on your sin has been too harsh. God's judgment on your sin was to go to hell. And if you're not going to hell, whatever you get, you're getting off light. Now, I'm going to tell you how to make peace with God. Kill it. But I don't think that's going to work. Do you want him to kill you? Because that will bring peace. But I don't think you want that. Okay, get God to surrender. Get God to run up the white flag and say to you, all right, I surrender whatever you want. But I wouldn't hold my breath until that happens, Buck. So that leaves us only one option. You know what that is? That is for you to get out your white flag and bow your knee. And say, I surrender. I told you, the object of war is to break the will of your enemy. Can I ask you a question? Come on, man. I'm talking to some people. I don't think you're stupid. I don't. I don't think anybody in here is stupid. Do you really think that there's something in you that you're going to carry the day with God and you're going to break His will? You're going to wear God out? You're going to wear God down? You're going to get God? You're going to besiege God until He finally says, okay, I give up. I'll let you have what you want. Because if you think that, man, you've been smoking your breakfast. Mm -hmm. You know what you need to do? You need to surrender. Mm -hmm. I told you, you know those, uh, those Japanese uh, in, in World War II? Uh, our, our, uh, yeah, I, I, I like up to hear about this, this hand-wringing God. You know, you think God is up in heaven going, Oh, please get right with me. Oh, I hate to see you living like this. Oh, please get... Whoa, whoa, whoa. We're talking about God, bud. We're talking about a righteous God. 
Let me tell you what happened on uh, August 6, 1945. On August 6, 1945, Hiroshima went up in one vast mushroom cloud and 80,000 people died. And there was absolutely nothing immoral or wrong about it. If you think there was, it's because you gave your heart to television to that. Three days later, on August 9, 1945, Nagasaki went up in a mushroom cloud and 70,000 people died. And there was nothing wrong with that. Now, let me ask you a question. You know, here's what happened. Uh, our people, our negotiators had approached the Japanese before those bombs ever fell. And they said, we want you to surrender. And the Japanese said, okay, under this condition, we'll surrender. And they said, no, no, unconditional. You know what unconditional surrender is? That's when they give you a blank sheet of paper, you sign your name, and then they fill it in. Well, I'll tell you something, people. If you ever have ever had to surrender unconditionally to anybody, the United States of America is the one to do it. Right. We are the we are the benevolent nation. We are the one that is magnanimous in our victories. We're the ones that do not rub our enemies' noses in their errors after the war is over. Amen. Only American soldiers can go through a town and kill every last enemy soldier, and within thirty minutes of the battle being over, they're handing out candy bars to the kid. This is a great nation. And so they told these Japanese, they said, uh, surrender. And they said, well, then we won't surrender. And on August 6th, the first mushroom cloud went up. And on August 9th, the next mushroom cloud went up. Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, you think about August 10th, our guys contacted the Japanese and said this. <laughs> we feel so bad about what happened. And we, we, we do. All those people just got new. We feel so bad about it. We don't need to We don't need more, more to die. You know what you don't know? They're getting ready to drop their bomb. I'll tell you what our negotiators said. They called Japanese up and said, you see them two clouds? You want to see another one? And them Japanese said, where's that paper? I've stood on the deck of the USS Missouri there, that is now anchored in Pearl Harbor, where those Japanese signed the surrenders for World War II. You know what it was? It was absolutely unconditional. You know what that meant? That meant we could have taken that nation over and dissolved it as a sovereign nation. We did. You know, if, if they'd have done to Iraq what they did to Japan in that first Gulf War, if they'd have, if they'd have gone to Baghdad, thrown Hussein off, and put Schwarzkopf as the king or the, the supreme leader of Iraq for about four years, and, and then if, if Schwarzkopf would have said the same thing to the United States that uh, MacArthur said when he was running uh, Japan, you know what MacArthur said? He said, I need hundreds of missionaries to come over here. Because Iraq will never be a nation until it's got some Christianity, and it'll never have that. And that nation might have had a chance. But guys, what I'm telling you is that we told those Japanese, here's what we said, sign it and trust us. Well, that's a hard thing to do. You know what God says to you today? Whether it's your victim of circumstances, whether it was just something that, that, you know, your family or your marriage or a problem with you, or whether it was a misconception of God or something in life, or it's either saying, you know what God's saying today? He is saying this, sign it and trust me now. Could anybody here tell me a valid reason why you should, why you should not be able to trust God? I don't think the problem is that you can't trust God. I think the problem is you can't bow your knee to Him and say, I surrender. And that's what you need to do. If you're going to have peace with God, He says, oh, you'll have peace with me. I'll never make peace with you. Don't say never, Bucko. You'll make peace with me. Will it be years? God says, yep, sure will. Yeah, you can make peace with me now. You'll probably do it about 25 years from now when you only got about three more weeks to live. Yeah, you're, you're really going to waste the next 25 years of your existence. I'm going to tell you this. I think we're out here pretty quick, but I don't got thinks we're going to be here until 2030. I think yeah. we might be here until 2030. Yeah. I don't believe it, but we still could. There's a valid way of saying we would be here, uh, and, and maybe we will. He dates to 2,000 years from the start of the ministry of Jesus Christ. But guys, let me tell you this. If we got another 25 years, and you're mad at God right now, if you, if you make peace with God today, 25 years from now, you, you know what you'll say? Man, I'm glad I took care of that back there. Am I ever glad I ran that white flag up to God there? Guys, I'm not telling you to humiliate yourself before some man. I'm not telling you to get on your knee, uh, be knees before a man or exalt some man. We're talking about the God that bought you with the blood of his son. Isn't that true?
Yeah. And I'm telling you this morning, look, if you are a victim of circumstances, if it's something you did not bring on yourself, uh, or even if it's a misconception of God, whatever the case may be, I am on your side. I do understand why you think what you're thinking. But I'm telling you, you can trust this God. But the only way you'll ever have peace is for you to run up that white flag because those other three are not an option. You will not kill him. I don't think you want him to kill you. And he is not going to, he is not going to surrender to you. That leaves only one option. You run that white flag up. But I am here to tell you, he can be trusted. Sign the paper and trust him. I'd like you to stand with your heads bowed. Your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I know the Bible says there are none good. I know. For that scriptural description, because of that, I, I will not say that you are good. But I've always said this, guys. I've always said there's none good, but there's some nice. And I would say this, guys. I would say that uh, as people go around here, you're probably some of the best. You say straight on the book, you're in church, here, you're on church on a Sunday afternoon. But even here, there can be just a little festering. There can be just a little bitterness, just a little animosity or anger toward this holy, righteous God. I'm not hitting you over the head with the Bible, okay? I'm not beating you. I'm not calling you a bad thing. The worst thing I can call you is a sinner, and that's just what I am. But how many would be honest enough to say this today? Preacher. Preacher, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'm saved, and I see some place, I see some area in my life where I need to make peace with God. Here's my hand to acknowledge that. Just lift your hand up. Come on. Come on. Put them up. All right, you know what to do. You put your hands down. You say, what do I do? Sign the surrender term. What's the term? Just sign your name and trust God. Wow, what horrible faith. I have to trust God. But you know what you might have to do? You might have to forgive Him. Not because He's ever done anything wrong, but because you didn't like what He did in your life. Maybe before we leave here, somebody needs to come and say to God, I forgive you for what you've done. I'm telling you again, not that He did wrong. But what he did, you sure didn't appreciate. Hey, God's done some things in my life I didn't appreciate. So maybe before we leave here, somebody want to get on their knees and say, Lord, I forgive you. And I surrender because I want peace with you. It'd be better to do it now than 25 years from now. Father, thank you for your goodness and thank you for your grace and thank you for your great kindness. Lord God, you are the good God. You are the holy God. God, you are good because you are good. You're not good because everybody's making you be good. And if you ever want to be bad, we would really be in a world of hurt. Lord, there's some hands that went up and some hands that should have. And there's somebody here that's just a little bit on the outs with you. And I am not calling them a name, God. I am not going to say that they are vicious or wicked or anything else. There have been some things in their life been tough and heartbreaking. And they feel that you could have made things different. And you could have, but you did not. And what they need to do now, God, is to forgive you. Not that you were wrong, but because you did what they did not appreciate in their life. And then they need to run that white flag up and just trust you to take care of everything from, on, from now on. And how could that be a bad thing? To surrender to God and trust Him. And so I hope somebody makes peace with you. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. With your heads bowed and eyes closed.